Well, I've already told you uh, several times what we're looking at this morning, so let's simply uh, turn up John chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 30. Uh, if you have the NASB, it probably has the heading in this section, Two Resurrections. <laughs> and the reason being is because it describes two resurrections. Again, the two that um, Jesus, I believe, already referred to uh, in our text uh, last week. So let's begin by reading the text. John chapter 5, verses 25 through 30. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own initiative as I hear, I judge, and my, just, my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now again, I, I have to admit, in each and every text we look at, there's, there's more than we're ever going to be able to cover in any one sermon, but we do want to try to get uh, the, the major points here. I just want to remind you, uh, especially as I read this last verse, as far as Jesus saying he can do nothing on his own initiative, that we've already looked at that last week. We saw clear, just clearly just, just how closely the Father and the Son are actually working together. As Jesus said, the Son did nothing except what he saw his Father doing. And we understood by that that the Father is continually revealing his plan to his Son. Because remember, his son, having taken on the limitations of humanity, doesn't have infinite knowledge. He does in his divine nature, but not in his human nature. And so the father is continually revealing his plan to his son. His son sees it, and his son continually submits to that plan and carries it out. Now, we saw just how important that is when we consider the work that both the father and the son have engaged uh, to undertake and that is the working out of God's plan of redemption. Doing what was necessary in order to save us from the judgment that was due to us for our sins. The Father and the Son are both intimately involved in bringing us to glory. Now I should mention the Spirit is involved as well because He applies that salvation to us. As we've seen in the past, the Father is to be glorified because He is the one who pays the price for our salvation. He gives His Son. The Son is to be glorified because He is the price. He lays down His life for our salvation. But the Holy Spirit is also to be glorified because He is what Jesus purchased in order that we might be saved. The difference between the believer and the unbeliever is the believer has the Spirit of God residing in him that which Adam lost in the fall. All of them are to be glorified. Now we also saw that what the Father planned to do, He planned in such a way that the Son would receive the honor for it. Jesus would have the privilege of coming into the world and purchasing spiritual life for us. He would have the honor of, of actually possessing that life and giving it to whom He will. He would have the honor of raising the dead on the last day. And of course, he would also have the honor of judging all men. The Father wanted everybody to honor the Son, even as they honor Him. He wanted to glorify the Son because He loves Him and because He delights in Him. And the Son, in turn, as you know, wants to honor and glorify the Father because He loves Him and delights in Him. Now, in our text this morning, Jesus goes on to explain a bit more about this authority and this honor that the Father has given to him. And that's what we want to consider this morning. Basically, 
it's unpacking or unfolding or explaining more clearly what these honors are that the Father has given to the Son. Now what we want to consider this morning is what Jesus refers to as the two resurrections. Now first we'll consider the spiritual resurrection that Jesus said had already begun and would continue into the future. But secondly, we want to consider the physical resurrection Jesus said would yet take place that was solely in the future. So first of all, let's consider the spiritual resurrection that had already begun and would continue into the future. Jesus says in verses 25 through 27 of our text, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now the resurrection Jesus speaks of here was, notice, still coming. And yet it already was. It was taking place at that time. A resurrection in which the dead, and here he is referring to the spiritually dead, not the physically dead, because Jesus will go on to tell us about the physical resurrection, that the dead would hear his voice. They would hear him preaching outwardly in the gospel. That's why he came into the world, wasn't it? He came to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven had come and that all men should repent and believe. But also to proclaim this gospel inwardly by his Holy Spirit. We call that the inward call. And that's the difference between those who respond to the gospel and those who do not respond. Jesus said that he was speaking and that those who heard by God's grace would live, that they would be raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. Now, he's not talking about speaking to corpses because corpses can't hear. He's talking about speaking to living men who are yet dead and that those who heard would live. They would be raised to life. And put it in other terms, they would stop hating God and begin loving Him. And so embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from their sins. Jesus says, just as the Father has life in Himself to confer spiritual life on whom He wills, so He gave to the Son to have life in Himself, to have the authority to bestow this life, to give the Spirit to whomever He wills. Basically, Jesus has the authority to give the Spirit. Even as he told the Nicodemus, you have to be born again, Jesus has the authority to confer that new birth that allows a person to see the kingdom of heaven and to be able to enter it by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus goes on to say that the Father has also given him authority to execute judgments. We read in the psalm this morning in our call to worship that God right now is ruling and reigning over the nations. He is judging the nations. But who is it? Which person of the Godhead right now is doing this work? Well, Jesus is a part of his reward for the work that he has done, has been entrusted with all power and authority to rule and reign now. After he died and was raised again to life, he ascended up into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. Right now he is ruling and he is reigning over the world. So he, was, he had authority back then to execute judgment as he ministered on earth. He has authority to do so now from, from heaven. And he also has authority in the future when he will raise all men and gather them, all the living together for the final judgment. He will judge all men at the final judgment because he is the son of man. This is what the Father has determined to do to honor His Son, to confer upon Him for His work of redemption, the honor of judging all men on that final judgment, as we saw last week. Now again, the first resurrection was taking place then during His earthly ministry as He was preaching the gospel. But Jesus also said, an hour is coming. In other words, it's still happening today. Jesus continues to speak today with a voice that raises the dead. And he is doing it outwardly through the gospel. But he's still speaking inwardly 
by his Holy Spirit. Which means that there is still a ministry that is entrusted to us. Jesus has made us his ambassadors to be able to share his gospel with others, to speak that outward call so that he may issue the inward call sovereignly as he wills. Now that is also our confidence that as we go out to share the gospel, even though we look at the society and we look at the condition of people's hearts, that there are going to be those who respond because Jesus has his sheep to gather. He will gather his sheep as we are faithful to tell others about Jesus Christ. But it also tells us another thing, and that is that if we have not trusted Jesus Christ, Jesus is still speaking. And so the question this text, first of all, asks you this morning is whether or not you have heard his voice whether or not Jesus has opened your eyes, whether or not he has changed your heart. Now, if he has, then praise God. You can trust in Jesus Christ. You will trust in Jesus Christ. That's the reason why you do trust in Jesus Christ is because of that. But if he hasn't yet done that, if you've still not trusted him, if you're still not following him, then you need to realize that Jesus is the one who has life in himself. He is the only one who can confer life. You need to go to Jesus for his life. And the way you do that is by praying, praying that God would give you, that Jesus would give you ears to hear, that he would give you a heart that would respond to him so that you will trust him, so that you will follow him, so that you will be ultimately safe from what we read about in Revelation chapter 20. The second death is a very real thing. It's referring to the lake of fire, which is the future form of hell, which nobody wants to be in. If you want to be safe from hell, you have to trust Jesus Christ. Now that part, I think, we, we, you know, is clear enough. Let's move on to the second resurrection. The first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection from a spiritually dead condition that condition which all of us came into the world to a new and better condition that gives us the power to trust in Jesus. But Jesus says there is a second resurrection, a physical resurrection that is yet to take place. Notice what he says in verses 28 through 30. Do not marvel at this. That is that resurrection is already taking place. For an hour is coming, and notice he doesn't say it's, it's happened yet. An hour is coming, it's in the future, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now I want you to notice here Jesus tells us an hour is coming uh, when he will speak. And all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. They will hear, even the dead. You see, they're all dead. They're going to hear because his voice is going to raise them. And they're going to come forth. Come forth to what? Well, Jesus tells us plainly here, they will come forth to judgment. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. It's for those who are part of the first resurrection, you see, that it's not a resurrection to judgment. It's a resurrection to life. And praise God that it is. But those who did the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. On that day, Jesus says he will be the judge, as we've seen. This is the honor that the Father has given to him. And he says his judgment will be just. It will be according to to their deeds. What could be juster than that, right? Well, we're going to look at that more this evening as we expand on the idea of judgment. But what I want us to do here is just pause for a moment and consider that what Jesus is saying here goes against what is most commonly taught, I believe, in the church today regarding the resurrection. Now, I say that only to bring it to your attention. I, I don't, on a certain sense, I I don't like necessarily drawing to our attention, you know, the, the, maybe the deficiencies or what might, maybe what I would consider to be the wrong views of others. But you know I have to do that because I have to, to teach what the Bible teaches. 
you also know that it's good for us to believe what the Bible teaches and not to believe simply what men choose to believe. Now, most evangelicals today believe in at least three resurrections. There's that resurrection of dead believers at the rapture just before the tribulation, again, according to popular belief today. The resurrection of dead believers and believing Jews after the tribulation and before the millennium in order to, well, bring them into the millennium as it were. There, there's others going in in their view having to do with those that survived the tribulation period. But also the resurrection of all the unbelievers who have ever lived following the millennium. Now there is some question about whether there's going to be another resurrection for believers who were killed during the millennium. It's interesting as you, as you go and you try to sort out how this, these other views fall out and you look at the charts, there, there's things that are, that are missing. I mean, are there no believers that die during the millennium? I mean, what about the final confrontation with Satan at the end? And uh, surely some people die there that have to be raised. Uh, we run into the same problem with regard to the judgment. So how many resurrections do they view here? There's at least three, maybe, maybe four. Now, why do they believe in multiple resurrections? Well, the answer is complicated, <laughs> to say the least. But a lot of it has to do with Revelation 20, okay? Because they want to go to Revelation 20 first. Because they say, well, here we have just a straightforward account of how things fall out. And then they want to interpret the rest of the Bible, everything else the Bible says in light of Revelation 20. Well, what is it that they see in Revelation 20? Well, we just read it, didn't we? They see a binding of Satan that follows what, you know, the, the tribulation period. They see a resurrection of the saints, which they believe to be physical. A thousand-year reign of Christ with his saints during the millennium. A releasing of Satan at the end for the final battle, uh, a coming of Christ in judgment. By the way, in this view, you have at least three comings of Christ. Coming for his church, coming at the end of the tribulation, coming at the end of the millennium. Okay? Well, a coming of Christ in judgment against Satan and his minions. A resurrection again of the dead and a final judgment of the dead. Now again, if this is a straightforward account, a literal account of the events, then you have at least two resurrections that appear to be you know, physical resurrections with a thousand years in between them. But we do need to ask ourselves the question, is that really what John means? Is that what John is saying? Now I mentioned a little bit earlier, Revelation 20 is prophecy. Prophecy that is given in highly symbolic, visionary language. It's really not meant to be taken literally. And again, it's, there's a question of, how we interpret the Bible, you see. Do we take into account that this is a vision or do we just say, well, we'll just, we'll just read it like anything else in the Bible, like one of Paul's letters. And we'll read poetry the same way. If we can understand it literally, we'll take it literally. If we can't, then we'll, we'll understand it's a symbol. But is that the way we should approach it? Or should we say visionary language, prophetic language, is, is symbolic language and we can't really take it in a straightforward way? Now, when I say that, let's, let's be careful to understand that we're not saying it doesn't mean anything. What we're saying is it is referring to something that is literal, and certainly Revelation 20 was talking about some literal events that were going to take place in the future from John's perspective. But what we are saying is that the language, we can't understand the language literally. We have to understand what the symbols mean. Let me give you an example. In Revelation chapter 13, where John talks about this beast that rises up out of the ocean that has seven heads and ten, ten horns and ten crowns on the ten horns, was John meaning to say that we should expect to see a creature like that literally come out of the ocean? I think that most understand that that's not what he means. Any more than when, when Pharaoh dreamed about the seven cows that came up out of the Nile, the real fat cows, remember? and how seven gaunt cows came after them and then ate those seven fat cows. And when they were done, they looked exactly the same. They were still skinny and gaunt and ugly. We shouldn't understand that a beast is going to rise up out of the ocean 
literally any more than Pharaoh was expecting to see seven cows come out of the Nile to be eaten by seven other cows after that. Those symbols meant that there was going to be seven years of plenty, at least for Pharaoh's dream, and then it would be followed by seven years of famine. So those cows were just simply symbols of plenty and of want. And we shouldn't expect to see those cows any more than we should expect to see a seven-headed beast come out of the ocean. It is a symbolic, it's symbolic, it's visionary language. We have to interpret prophecy that's given in a visionary way with a certain set of tools that takes into account that there's a high degree of symbolism. Okay. Now, by the way, we do have this principle enumerated for us in Scripture very clearly by the Lord when he came down to rebuke Aaron and Miriam for speaking against Moses and the woman that he had married. He actually gives us the key to understanding prophecy in Numbers 12, verses 6 through 8. Listen to what he says. He said this to Aaron and Miriam. He said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Now what is this passage telling us? It's telling us that sometimes God speaks to his prophets in dark and obscure language, in dreams and in visions. And sometimes he speaks to them mouth to mouth, which means face to face basically, it's a Hebrew idiom, or clearly, bald facely we would say. Now as I've already told you, Revelation 20 is highly symbolic, visionary language. It is a vision full of symbols, and we are not to understand it literally. Now this is my point. My point is we shouldn't go to Revelation 20 and begin there because of the symbols to try to understand what the Lord is going to do. Instead, we should go to the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament, and read the clearer teaching of the New Testament, what we read in the Gospels, what we read in the Epistles, and start there. We do need to let Scripture interpret Scripture, but we need to let clearer Scripture interpret what is more obscure or what is less clear. And I think we would all agree that what is straightforwardly uh, spoken is going to be easier to understood than what's spoken in symbols. So let's look at our passage. What does Jesus teach here regarding the resurrection? Well, he does teach that there are two, but the first is clearly spiritual, the second is physical. But he also teaches that there is only one resurrection, not th three resurrections, not four resurrections. Because again, I would just have you note where he's talking about the resurrection, he says, an hour is coming. An event is going to take place at one time. When he says all who are in the tombs, not some, but all, will come forth. They're going to come forth at the same hour. And all will be judged. Not just the righteous, which is again what the multiple resurrections say. The first resurrection is just the righteous. The second is going to be righteous and wicked. The third is going to be only wicked. But it says here, all are going to come forth. All are going to be judged at the same time. Not only the righteous, but also the wicked. Now, this has to be the only physical resurrection because it includes everybody in the tombs, everybody who has died. It also has to be the only one because, and we're not going to have time to get into this, but if there's only one resurrection, guess what? The resurrection is going to take place at the time of the rapture because there's clearly a resurrection taking place when Jesus comes again. I think we'd all agree with that. The dead in Christ are going to be raised first, and then we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. But if there's only one resurrection... And if this resurrection is in order to bring everybody to judgment, 
then not only are the believers raised, but the unbelievers are raised. That's what we're reading about here in this text. And not only are the living Christians raised or, or translated, but the living everybody are also translated because they're all being brought together for one reason, and that is the final judgment. So all are being raised and all are being gathered in order that all may be judged at one time. And by the way, if you've, if you've gathered all the living and you've raised all the dead, then can there be more resurrections? Are there going to be, you know, there can't be because everybody's already been raised. There's nobody left to die because all the living have also been gathered together. If we had more time to get into that, it would be something to see. But I have more, more evidence. Okay. It must be the only physical resurrection because the Bible speaks of the resurrection as though it is only one. Isn't it interesting that everywhere the resurrection is spoken of in Scripture, it is called the resurrection. Let me give you some examples. When the Sadducees tried to trap Jesus in what we would call a reductio ad absurdum, they take what Jesus was saying, they're trying to reduce it to absurdity with their question about the man or the woman who had married the seven brothers. In the resurrection, whose wife is she going to be of the seven? Well, well, that's the question, I guess, that I wanted to look in Matthew twenty-two, twenty-eight. For they all married her. Notice he's, they say, in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? In what resurrection? In the resurrection. You see, there's only just the one. When Jesus comforted Martha regarding the death of her brother Lazarus in John 11, verses 23 through 24, he said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. In the resurrection on the last day. Paul told the Philippians that his one goal in life was to leave everything that he had done before Christ behind, everything as a Pharisee, and to press forward to Christ. Why? In Philippians 3, 10 through 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And here, of course, he's talking about the resurrection to life. He doesn't want to be in the group, the resurrection to judgment, of course, or among the wicked, or as we're going to see this evening, among the goats. Paul even rebuked two men for upsetting the, the faith of some believers because they were claiming the resurrection had already taken place. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 16 through 18, Paul says to Timothy, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Now again, we have several examples of, of these individuals speaking about the resurrection, but which resurrection were they referring to? Were they talking about the one for believers when Jesus returns? Were they talking about the, the, the one for the tribulation saints and the believing Jews when the millennium begins? Were they talking about that one for the wicked at the end of the millennium or the righteous if some happen to die during the millennium? You see, if there were three physical resurrections, they would have to distinguish which one they were referring to, but they didn't. Instead, they just called it the resurrection. Now again, what is it that people who believe in three resurrections do with that? They say, well, the resurrection is divided into three resurrections. Okay, well, what, what can you do with that? You, again, I think it's clear from what they're being, what's being said here that there is only one. And when we get back to what Jesus said, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will come forth. So, and they're all going to be judged, okay? So we can't divide it into three. By the way, I should just mention, when you do understand Scripture in this way and you don't have three and four resurrections, you don't have three and four judgments, you don't have three or four second comings of Christ, you don't have several battles and so forth, it really makes everything quite simple. Jesus comes again, raises all the dead, translates the living, there's a final judgment, and there's the eternal state. 
We believe that Jesus is coming again. We believe he's going to raise the dead. We believe that there is going to be a rapture, but it's going to be at the last day. We, re we know there's a final judgment, but we don't believe in many of them. We believe there's only one of each. And that, again, like I said, makes things quite simple. That's, that's good. I don't think scripture needs to be complicated. It really is, is simple in many ways. We just tend to make it more complicated. And we'll look a little bit more at that this evening when we consider the final judgment and, and why it is that we're tempted to, to do this and to multiply so many of them. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that this evening. But again, I want you to see here that there is only one. And now we need to ask the question, who cares? What difference does it make? Does it really make any difference? Well, there's different levels of answering that question, right? I mean, on one level, it doesn't make any difference because things are going to happen exactly as the Lord has planned regardless of what we believe. Our brethren who believe in three resurrections, they're going to see just one if, if we happen to be right, right? It doesn't really matter. Their belief doesn't matter at one level because we all make mistakes in certain places. We just need to make sure they're not at the fundamentals of the gospel. We can't afford to be wrong there or we're going to miss the first resurrection, which is going to make us liable to the second death. Again, we won't be spiritually raised without believing the truth. But on another level, it does matter, doesn't it? Because you want to believe the truth. And when you're telling other people how things are, what the Bible teaches, you want to be able to teach them the truth. Uh, you, you want to make sure that you don't confuse other people. I mean, Hymenaeus and Philetus were confusing people by saying something had happened that hadn't taken place. And if you teach people that something happens to be true, it can create some difficulties. But now there is one other, one other thing, and it really depends on your eschatology as to whether this could be a real threat or not. Because confusion in this area could hurt someone. I mean, think about this for a minute. Think about the person who believes that there's three resurrections. People who believe that also believe that if you miss it, if you miss the first one, that you'll be able to catch the second, you know, it, it, something along those lines. In other words, that if you miss the first when Jesus comes for his church, since they believe the rapture is connected to it, even though you're going to have to endure a tribulation that is following, and again, on this view, one resurrection, the tribulation comes before and not after, okay? Well, if I miss the first, maybe I'm going to have to go through the tribulation, but if I survive through that and hold on to Christ, I can still be saved. You see, I'm still going to have a second chance, and this might cause people to bank on a second chance. I mean, I don't know if you ever thought that way. When, when I was in that camp, that's kind of how I was thinking. Because I was also thinking that, well, I might be a Christian today, but I might not be tomorrow. And if I'm not tomorrow and the Lord comes and the rapture takes place and I'm left, well, I have a second chance. But you see, that isn't going to happen. For one thing, if you're saved, you're not going to lose your salvation. That's another thing we, we strongly believe the Bible teaches. But we also believe that when Jesus comes, that's it. Okay, You better be ready for when he comes because you don't get a second chance. Jesus says in verse 28, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. You have to be ready before he comes the first time because he's only coming once. You don't get the second chance. So does it matter what you believe regarding the number of resurrections? Well, it, it can believe. It can make a big difference, especially if you haven't trusted Jesus because you want to be ready when he comes. By the way, there's no guarantee you're going to live to the second coming either, is there? You, you want to be ready for when you die. And when's that going to happen? Well, who knows? God knows. He's the only one who knows. We don't know. We could die tomorrow. We could die today. We could die a year from now, 10 years from now. We don't know the day of our death, which means we have to be ready. Not to mention the fact that if you want to be ready for when the Lord comes, you need to make sure that you're ready before he comes. <laughs> you need to make sure you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So do you want to know that you're not going to end up in the lake of fire? What is called the second death in Revelation 20? The only way you can make sure is that you listen to Jesus now. He offers you spiritual life now in the gospel. Again, remember what he said in John 5, 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live and those who hear will not be afraid of the second death. Do you hear Jesus speaking this morning? He is speaking, by the way. I'm not Jesus. But Jesus is speaking through his word, right? This is how he speaks, through his word, through preaching. Jesus is speaking. Do you hear his voice? If you do, then trust him. Turn from your sins and he will save you. Revelation 20, verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Again, the spiritual resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Do you know that Peter says that we are priests before the Lord as believers and that one day we're going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ when we leave this world and enter into glory where he is reigning right now? Right now you are a priest in the sense that you are to offer up to the Lord continually sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. That's why we gather together to worship the Lord on the Lord's Day because now we are offering to God like priests, sacrifices of praise. But you're not going to do this just on earth, but also in heaven. When you join with him in his reign that he is now enjoying, seated at the right hand of God. But I wish we had time to go into all the other details of Revelation 20, but let me just say this. Right now, Jesus is reigning. Right now, Satan is bound. Not absolutely, but he has a chain connected to him. He's always had a chain connected to him. Remember what Jesus said when he cast out the demon and they accused Jesus of doing that by the prince of demons? He says, if Satan is divided against himself, his house is going to fall. But he says, but how can a man plunder the strong man's house? How can anyone plunder the strong man's house unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. Jesus was saying that somebody stronger than the strong man, who is Satan, has bound the strong man, that is, has bound Satan, and is plundering his house. That's what's going on right now during the present age, during this thousand years, which I believe is the time between Christ's first coming when he binds Satan and the second coming when just before he comes, Satan is let off the chain and we get to see who the believers and unbelievers really are. There's that final escalating persecution against the church. And then Jesus comes once, in the second coming, to destroy them. See, those are other people that need to be raised after Jesus, as it were, devours them with, with fire as he saves his church from persecution and gathers all the dead to the final judgment, which in Revelation 20 is called the great white throne judgment, in which all are going to be judged because there's only one resurrection and there is only one judgment. Well, again, if you want to be a part of the first resurrection to enjoy these blessings and to rule and reign with Christ in his reign Right now when you die, if you want to be priests and kings on the earth, if you want to escape the second death and have no fear of it, then listen to Jesus as he speaks to you this morning and turn from your sins and trust him to save you. That's the only way you're going to escape it is if you trust in the Lord. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, again, show us how we need to apply what we've heard uh, to our lives individually. Well, let's pray.